Amen. Well, all right. Today, we are continuing our sermon series uh, called The Joy of Belonging. And we have been going through this. This is kind of a, a way of us to explain to those individuals who maybe you've been considering joining our church as a member, or maybe you used to be a member, and now you've come back and like, oh man, is my membership still good? Like, what do I have to do? So, if you are one of those individuals who is interested, we are going through this little book during this sermon series called The Joy of Belonging. This is put out by uh, the General Council of the Assemblies of God. And we're not going through this book word for word because there are some things that are unique to our local assembly uh, that are not mentioned in this book. Some of those being the core values that are on the four pillars around the room here that we've covered for the last two weeks. So uh, if you missed those two sermons, I would recommend you go back and listen to those. But today, we are going to uh, talk about, and we're going to take a deep dive, pun intended, on one of the ordinances of the church, which uh, as an Assembly of God church, we have two ordinances. One is water baptism, which we're going to be covering today, and the other is Holy Communion, or the Lord's Supper, which uh, and I did not plan this out originally. Originally, this was not the topic for today's sermon, but we're serving communion today also, so that worked out really well. So, uh, but today, I want to talk to you guys about baptism. Now, this is something that, um, it, it, it was a big deal in the early church. And over the years, it kind of became either a very, very, really, 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 really important thing in the church that became harder and harder for those to qualify for, or it was something that was downplayed in the church, and um, in different ways it was uh, made more accessible to the point where it didn't mean much anymore. And so I want to go into the details today of how we view baptism as an Assembly of God church in Byesville, Ohio. What do we uh, emphasize when we talk about baptism? And we have to ask ourselves the question, is baptism still important? Is baptism still important? And um, obviously, by the time that we get to the end of this sermon, you should be able to answer that question pretty well. Uh, but we're going to start off today by asking just what is water baptism? Now, how many of you guys, just by a quick show of hands, you were baptized in water at some point during your Christian walk? All right. So most of you guys in here were um, this is going to be a sermon just to re-emphasize this for you then. And for those maybe that, that have never been baptized in water, or maybe you're like, well, I was sprinkled as a child, so does that count, Pastor? I don't understand, you know, what, why are there all these different forms of baptism? We're going to get into that a little bit today, and hopefully give you a little bit of clarity on that. So first off, the very first thing that we need to realize when it comes to the topic of baptism is that it's not for everyone. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, baptism, according to the Bible, is for believers. Baptism is for believers. You see, first comes salvation, and then as we'll, we're going to see in the te New Testament, in especially the book of Acts, and the commands of Jesus is salvation comes first, believing comes first, and then baptism happens. Now, why do we make this distinction? Why is it that we have to talk about the proper order of this? Well, because there are other denominations and other fellowships that they say, well, it's, it's, it's not as important on which order you do this in. And so you end up with things like infant baptism, or you end up with things like being baptized as part of a catechism process, and again, or a confirmation process, and again, I'm not saying that those are necessarily wrong, and they have reasons for those beliefs, but as an Assembly of God church, we believe that baptism is for believers, that you need to have made a conscious decision to follow Christ in order to be baptized. You need to have repented and accepted his act of salvation on your behalf. Where do we get this from? Well, this isn't just something that we pulled out of the air and said, you know what, this is a hoop we want you to jump through. We are trying to be in accordance with the scriptures. You see, in both Matthew and Mark, when Jesus gives what we know of as the Great Commission, he lays down this order of belief first and then baptism. Explain that to me a little bit more, Pastor Charlie. Love to. All right. So in Matthew chapter 28, which is where we find Matthew's rendition of the Great Commission, he says, this is Jesus talking, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing 
them. And then in Mark, we read this. He who has believed and been baptized shall be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And so we see here that we, we have baptism happening after belief. And Mark is a little bit more passive in this, uh, where Mark is, I'm sorry, Matthew's a little bit more passive, where he's saying, you know, make disciples and baptize them. You cannot be a disciple if you do not believe in the teacher that is the one trying to disciple you, all right? So we have those that are, have chosen to believe and are following the way of Jesus, and now Jesus is saying, when you have individuals like this, baptize them into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mark makes it even more clear, okay? And, and this is where we draw a distinction from some other denominations who would say, baptism is an act of salvation, that you cannot be truly saved unless you are baptized. And here Mark says that he who has believed and been baptized, they say, see, see, it needs to be both. If you're not baptized, you're not saved. And they totally negate the second part of Mark's words here and where he says, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. He doesn't say whoever does not believe and is baptized. He, just, he puts the emphasis again on the following and the obedience to Jesus Christ. And we see it again in the book of Acts. We are going to walk through just really quickly a couple of these scriptures. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, the day of Pentecost has come and Peter has stood up and he has preached a message and all of these people say, what should we do? What We have done this evil. We have crucified Jesus. We have, we have denied God. What now should we do? And Peter tells them right here, those who accepted his message were baptized and were about 3,000 that were added to their number that day. So again, we see belief happening first, and then once they have confessed that belief and said, yes, we are going to follow Jesus, yes, we repent of what we did to the Messiah, it is then Peter who says, now let's baptize these individuals to kind of seal this deal, to say a public proclamation of, yes, we are going to follow this way. And then again in Acts chapter 10, we see Peter at Cornelius' house. Now Cornelius was a Gentile. And they did not have full access to God like the Jewish people. But God, by the Holy Spirit, leads Peter to preach to Cornelius and these Gentiles. And they see the Holy Spirit fall upon these individuals. They start speaking in unknown languages. And then Peter, recognizing that the Holy Spirit has been poured out, then says, hey, these guys have full access to belief and follow Jesus. Therefore as we can read here in the bottom section of Scripture, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It's belief that qualifies you for baptism. Now, um, the other interesting thing that we see in the story at Cornelius' house is that people are baptized in the Holy Spirit before they are baptized in water. And I remember I've, I've been to several other churches and um, I've been in non-denominational churches where uh, they, they are very, very charismatic. They really believe in the gifts of the Spirit. They're uh, what we would call kind of hyper-Pentecostal. And so some of those churches would say that there's an order even here that you need to believe and then be baptized in water and then baptized in the Holy Spirit. However, they would then have to ignore what happens at Cornelius' house because what we see here is these individuals are first filled with the Holy Spirit and then they are baptized in water. And so you don't have a, a set order on these things. Now, me personally, uh, when I was first, first became a Christian, first surrendered my life and believed, it was December of uh, 2001 when that happened. In uh, January of 2002, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I had not yet been baptized in water. I could not have been because I was working at a job where I could not get Sundays off. And so I got saved, and then it was probably about another month before I made it back to church, and then I got filled with the Holy Spirit, and then it was almost three more weeks before they had a baptismal service where I was allowed to get baptized. So what we see here is that even though both of these experiences that we're going to be talking here in just a few minutes, these are powerful and important experiences in your Christian walk, there is no set order for them. 
as long as you first believe the order of baptism in the Holy Spirit or baptism in water, it can go back and forth. All right? Anybody else have a similar experience where maybe you were baptized in the Holy Spirit before being baptized in water? All right. Me and you, we're, we're in this together, all right? All right, so uh, what else is baptism? It's for believers. The second thing we need to realize is that according to our Assembly of God doctrine, baptism is by immersion or submersion, as I have on the screen here. Full submersion, I might add here, all right? Why do we believe that? Because, again, there are other denominations who uh, they just pour water over your head or, you know, they sprinkle or, or they do these different things. Well, we in the assemblies, we want to be as true to the text as we can. And so we look at the Greek word, which in this case is the word baptizo. And we look at what did the word baptizo mean? If somebody had read that or they had heard the commandment of Jesus to believe and be baptized, what would that have meant to them? And what we find is that this word, the literal translation of it is to plunge, dip, or fully immerse. And so when Jesus uses that word, his thinking was, just as John was doing at the River Jordan, that people would be fully submerged under the water and then come back up out of the water as a symbol of their cleansing. In fact, when we look at sources outside of the Bible, because this word is used in other Greek texts outside of the New Testament, and when we see it used there, it is again used in the same sort of sense. It is used in uh, ancient non-Christian literature to mean that somebody was plunged into something, or that they sank deeply down into something, or that they were completely drenched to where their whole body was soaked. That maybe they were in a battle, for example, and the, the writer that was recording this battle said that the entire army was baptized, meaning that the rain was coming down to the point where they were soaked through and through with the water, or they were completely overwhelmed by a situation. And so we look at the Greek word and we say to ourselves as an Assembly of God church that when you are baptized, you go fully under the water of baptisms, and you come fully back up out of the water of baptism. And it is also a highly symbolic thing, as we're going to be talking about here in just a few moments. But let's move on. So what else is baptism? The easiest way that I can explain baptism, and this is how it was explained to me many, many years ago, is that baptism is symbolic. It's an outward expression of a cleansing that has happened inwardly. It is an outward expression of a cleansing that has happened inwardly. When you surrendered your life to Jesus, I cannot uh, look at you with 3D glasses of so or with um, uh, X-ray glasses rather of some sort and say, "Oh man, yeah, I saw those chains fall off that person's heart, or I saw their their soul go from uh, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light." We can't see that. We can see the changes that take place in an individual where, you know, uh, maybe they, they were very bitter and, and very cantankerous before, and now they are a person filled with the joy of the Spirit. We can see those outward expressions, but we can't see the deep cleansing that has happened. And so Jesus gives us this symbol so that we can see and we can testify to those around us that, yes, a cleansing has happened, something important has happened in my life. I have gone from being the old creation to being a new creation through the waters of baptism. Now, throughout my Christian walk and throughout my time as a pastor, um, I've, I've done evangelism trainings. I've talked to different people about how to share your faith and things. And let me just tell you that uh, this is something that is becoming more and more difficult for people to do, which is share their faith with unbelievers or share their faith with even fellow believers. You know, the, the amount of stage fright that's happening uh, in America and around the world today is probably at an all-time high level. And I think a lot of that is because the people just enjoy hiding behind their screens. You know, they, they, they would rather be thumb warriors than testifiers for God. And so baptism is the easiest, the number one way that you can shout out to everyone, look what God has done for me. 
Look at what Jesus has done. Look at how awesome my Savior is. And you don't have to say a single word because here amongst fellow believers, when you go into the baptismal, everybody knows that this is what is being symbolized. This is why I am doing this. This is the step that I am taking in obedience to follow the example of Christ. It is the easiest way for you to share your testimony. Now, here at Byesville, we do give individuals an opportunity that if they would like to say something before they're plunged, and uh, in the future, hopefully, we'll be able to, to get to where we can maybe record some folks ahead of time before they're baptized with their testimony that we can be playing while uh, they're being baptized. But we give an individual an opportunity, should they want to, to explain why am I being baptized today. It is so important, you guys. I've said it a, a hundred times at least since I've been here for almost a year now, and I'm going to keep saying it, that one of the travesties of the church today is that we no longer have a time when we are allowed to share testimonies with one another. We don't have a set time, and, and for many of you in this room, you may remember Sunday night services. That was like the time that we always did this, that you know we would come back on Sunday evening, usually around 6 or 7, and uh, they would sing a couple of worship songs, and at least the churches that I first cut my Christian teeth in, uh, usually after worship, before the pastor shared any kind of devotional, who has a testimony? Who wants to talk about who, what God has done for them this week? You guys remember this? Anybody else but me? This was like the way that we encouraged one another. And nowadays, we may have a meet and greet time a little bit during the service like what we did earlier, but we don't give time for testimonies like we used to. Now, having said that, let me say this also that uh, I've said this before and I'm going to keep on saying it, that as much as I love you guys and as much as I do enjoy preaching, I am not the most important person in this room on Sunday morning. And so if the Holy Spirit has done something for you throughout the week that you would like to tell the congregation and you would like to edify this church body with, man, find me before service or shoot me a text or an email throughout the week and say, Pastor Charlie, this is an amazing thing that's happening. Can I share this on Sunday morning? And there's a high likelihood I'm going to put a microphone in your hand and say yes. All right, and just so you know, I'm going to give you a microphone not because I don't think you can talk loud enough, but because I want those that are watching the video to also be encouraged by your words. And so uh, the way that we have the sound system set up, they can't hear you if you don't have a microphone on, all right? So I want to encourage you guys, if God is moving in your life, if God is doing something incredible, if God has been working in your life, I would love to allow you to testify to this church body. I was talking with a, a friend of mine about baptism and, and reminding each other of when we were baptized and sharing our individual stories of it. And, and we got off on this topic of what I'm talking about now, which is sharing testimonies. And uh, what he said is that, you know, in, in his church, they actually, every fifth Sunday is Testimony Sunday. On Sunday morning, the pastor does not preach. So if there's not a lot of testimonies, guess what? They're just going to sing some worship songs, pray, and head home for the day. Because it's important that we share our testimonies with one another, you guys. The book of Revelation says they over overcome the enemy by what? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Not listening to a preacher preach a 30 to 40 minute message. Okay? I want to encourage you, yes. I want you to understand the Bible, yes. But at the same time, I want you guys to take ownership of your faith and to be the body of Christ and to share those moments with one another. All right. So it is an, an outward expression, and it should be a public expression. It should be before fellow believers. We see this over and over again in the book of Acts throughout the New Testament that when a baptism happened, there were always witnesses there. Now, having said that, have I done some baptisms where uh, it was just me and an individual who maybe was an invalid or was somebody who uh, could not get out of their house and so I've done private baptisms? Yes. However, even in that instance, I always had two or three of their family members there with them. It was never just me and the other individual. All right? So it should be a public proclamation of this inward cleansing. What else is it though? It is, well... Let's go to the negative side really quick. It is not, and I mentioned this once already today, it is not an act of salvation in itself. It is not an act of salvation in itself. Now, why do we have to emphasize this? Because there are those who believe out there 
whether they are you know individuals or you know there are still some denominations out there that are a little bit more fringe but uh, that believe that it is the water of baptism that saves you that you know it doesn't matter how i'm living my life it doesn't matter what kind of person i'm living as it doesn't matter if i'm bearing spiritual fruit as a christian as long as i have been through those waters i'm good and so I've had to, uh, I've actually, believe it or not, I have denied people being baptized because they had this belief. And, you know, whether it came from them reading the text wrong or some uh, bad teaching in their past, I can't tell you. But I have had individuals that said, Pastor, I, I have to be baptized. I, I can't be saved unless I'm baptized. And I would say to them, well, have you confessed your sin? Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm still a wretched sinner, but I need to be baptized. Please, Pastor, baptize me. I said, Sorry. You're misunderstanding what's going on here. Let's have a bigger conversation about the fact that belief needs to come first. If you're expecting baptism to bring salvation, then you're making salvation dependent on a work of yourself, not on the work of Christ. This is why belief has to come first, because we recognize He has done all of the work. I am merely being obedient to what He has done. Uh, Stanley Horton and William Menzies, who wrote the book, literally wrote the book on our Pentecostal doctrine, have this to say when it comes about to water baptism. They say, the water of baptism does not cleanse us, but is a testimony to our faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, a faith we must have before we go into the water of baptism. Therefore, it is not the water itself that saves us, but what coming through the water represents to us which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the resurrection that showed God had accepted Christ's sacrifice on our behalf and in our place. The New Testament clearly shows it is the blood of Jesus, not the water of baptism, that brings us cleansing and forgiveness. By his blood we are justified, our conscience is cleansed, and we are redeemed. Can I get an amen? All right, still with me. Um, now look, at the same time I've known people that have gone years and years and years from the moment that they were saved to the moment that they finally were baptized because, as I said at the beginning of the message, baptism was so downplayed in their church of, well, you know, you can do it, you cannot do it, but it's not, it's not really that big of a deal. But what I'm going to say to you today is that, yes, it is a huge deal. Why is it a huge deal? Because it is your first step in obedience to Christ. He commanded, be baptized. He commanded, baptize the disciples. He commanded, those who have believed and been baptized will be my follower. It is a simple first step, but it, in my opinion, is a very important first step. Theologian Millard Erickson, one of my favorite theologians, put it like this. He says, unlike repentance and conversion, baptism is not indispensable to faith. It seems rather that baptism may be an expression or a consequence of conversion. What he's saying here is that if you have been saved, if you have witnessed and experienced that regenerative power of Jesus Christ, your very next thought should be, here is water, what prevents me from being baptized? You guys, I can tell you that one of the most powerful things that baptism is, it is, a, it is a way that we identify ourselves with Christ. This is one of the most powerful things in my opinion and through my experience that I have experienced as a believer in Christ. There was just something that happened when they took me down into the waters and brought me back up. It just it connects you with Jesus in a way that other experiences in this life just cannot. And the Apostle Paul wrote this out very, very clearly in Romans chapter 6. And really, the entire first section of Romans chapter 6 is a testament to what baptism is symbolic of. But I want to focus in just on verse 4 here for our purposes today. It says this, we are therefore buried with him through what? Through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too may live a new life. As a Christian, you are not required to go find a tomb, roll a stone in front of it, and then come bursting out of it again when you become a Christian. 
Instead, what Jesus has said and what Paul is laying down here is that baptism is symbolic of you going through the same process of dying to self, surrendering in the waters, and then coming back up, resurrected into new life, just as he came out of the tomb. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? You guys, this is so powerful for those who are experiencing baptism. And we have two candidates for baptism next week. However, I want to make you aware that if you have never been baptized since you've believed in Jesus Christ, or if you would like to be baptized because you had a rough time in your Christianity where you, in a way, walked away from the faith, and you want to say, I am fully committed again. I'm ready to get back with God. I'm ready to walk in the way of obedience. Can I be rebaptized? And the answer to that question is yes. In the assemblies of God, we accept those who wish to be rebaptized to symbolize a new commitment to Christ. So if you need an info sheet, if you are like, man, this is a lot, Pastor Charlie. You're talking a lot. You're talking fast. You're, you're from South Dakota. You guys talk crazy fast, all right? I put this into a uh, kind of frequently asked question sheet for you. It's on the back in the Welcome Center. And uh, if you are one of the candidates who has been signed up to be baptized, uh, I want to encourage you to pick up one of these today so that you uh, have any other further questions that you may have that maybe I didn't cover today. They should be covered by this sheet. And it'll also tell you uh, what the protocol will be for next week when we're doing our baptism. So it is a way that we identify with Christ. Christ himself was baptized. Now, we've covered a lot of ground here this morning. We've talked about how it is a symbol of the inward cleansing. We've talked about how belief has to come first. We have talked about what is going on when we are baptized. We have talked about proper order of baptism. All of these things we have talked about, if we really think about it, was Jesus required to do this? Could he believe in himself? Could he, did he need to repent of sin? You know, all these different things, and one of the things that we need to cover before we wrap up for today is, why was Jesus baptized? Because he was. He was baptized by John the Baptist. We have this recorded in the Gospels, the biography of Jesus' life. But if everything we've talked to up to this point, we would look at that and say, well, that really doesn't apply to Jesus, so why was Jesus baptized? I don't understand. You know, help me out a little bit. Well, okay, great. Let's go through these really fast. Number one, Jesus was baptized to symbolize the beginning of his ministry of salvation. It was right after he was baptized that the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness for a time of testing, and then he comes back and he starts his earthly ministry. So it was almost like he was setting that mark of baptism is what begins my ministry here. It's where I shift from being just another man to being the Messiah. I'm taking on that responsibility. And so it is with us also that we identify in this way that when we believe and when we have been baptized, it, as I said before, is that first step of obedience that says, I am now ready to go forth as a new creation, as a Christian, just like my Savior did. Number two, it was to show support for the ministry of John the Baptist. John had been proclaiming that there was going to be one who is coming after him, the strings of whose sandals he was not worthy to untie, who is going to baptize you not with water, but with fire in the Holy Spirit. And so in order to validate John's ministry and the words that John had been preaching, Jesus goes to John and says, we must do this that all righteousness might be fulfilled. That was part of what he was saying in those comments is that, John, I am saying that yes, what you have been preaching has been preparing the way for the Messiah, and I am that individual. Thirdly, he was baptized to identify with our humanness. To identify with our humanness. He could have went his whole life without doing this, and yet he said, no, I am both fully God and fully man. One of the early heresies of the first century church was that Jesus was not really a physical person, that he was not fully human, that he was like this ghost man that went along, that every now and then he would make himself so you could touch him and that you could grab hold of him, but really he wasn't really fully there because Jesus was God and he was just God. And so here we see Jesus saying, no, I am fully like you. I identify with you, my brother. I identify with you, my sister. I also experience what it means to be human 
in this world. And lastly, the one that we've covered uh, quite a bit here today is that he wanted to give us an example to follow. He wanted to give us an example to follow. If Jesus was fully baptized by full submersion by John the Baptist, then he had the authority later after the resurrection to say, go and make disciples and baptize them. And oh, by the way, when you baptize them, I want it to look like this. Remember how I was baptized, guys? Make it look like that. Karen, if I could have you come to the piano this morning. So again, is baptism a big deal? Yes, it is a big deal. Is it something that's going to condemn you if you've never been baptized? No. But at the same time, if you have believed in Jesus as your Savior, why would you not want to be baptized? And guys, look, I, again, if I could have my, my gentleman come forward, we're going to serve communion here in just a moment. Come on up, guys, and get ready for that. I have um, had the honor of baptizing many individuals through my ministry career. And I can remember I had one young lady who was terrified of water. Like, she, she was so scared of drowning, and she was very, very anxious. And, you know, she had gotten saved when she was early in her teenage years. Now here she was, she was almost 20, and she had never been baptized. She heard me preach this exact message. And she said, I need to do that, but pastor, I'm scared. I, I, don't, I don't want to take the risk. What can I do? And I said, well, you know, here's what we can do for you then. Is, you know, usually when we baptize, you know, we take them back and we bring them back up. I said, if that is too much for you, then all I need you to do is, we, the baptismal tank is plenty full enough. We'll just dip you down. You can just squat down and come right back up and we'll take you all the way under like that. Is that okay? And she said, absolutely, I would love that. Oh, that, that would make me feel so comfortable. I said, perfect, all right, so let's do it. And man, guys, I can remember, I, I should have found the video for, for you of this young lady. I, I'm pretty sure it's still out there somewhere on the interwebs. But uh, man, she came up out of that baptismal tank and she leaped out. She went down and she jumped up, whooping and hollering, hands raised, praising God that she got to identify with her Savior in that way. This young lady was never the same again. Today she serves as a, as a nurse in the Chicagoland area, and she helps to run a ministry uh, called Royal Family Kids. Every summer she puts on a camp for foster kids who can't go to other camps and shares the love of Jesus with them. And I believe that it all started at that moment of her baptism, that she felt fully qualified to minister for Jesus. Father, thank you that you have washed us. God, I pray that you would bless your people now as we leave this place. God, help us to walk in the freedom that you have afforded us through the sacrifice of Jesus. God, help us to be an example to this world of what it means to show the love of God and to be loved by God. God, we thank you in your name. Amen. And amen. Well, hey, be friendly as you leave today, and we will see you next week, guys. God bless you.